Gracious God, you are so good to us, and it's amazing how you help us no matter what we're going through. And so, Lord, we bless you as we continue to worship and hear your word now. In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. It's great to worship, and as you can tell, all the songs are selected as we think about this theme of how to have courage and not complain, that in the midst of suffering and pain, can we say, it is still good with my soul? Can we still say, as we sang, even when we feel you're not working, you are working on our behalf, God? This morning, I want to talk about complaining. Three weeks ago, I talked about criticizing. Last week, I talked about the COVID crisis, and now I want to talk about complaining. I feel like Sesame Street, when a Muppet says, this week's topic starts with the letter C. And if I can add another C word to that, it is courage. How can we have courage when we suffer and not complaining? Complaining. We do it a lot. We often have justifiable reasons to complain. There is a lot to complain about right now. But ultimately, living a life of complaining is not healthy or helpful. And if you're one who complains a lot, you may discover that you're not fun to be with. Friends may start to retreat when they see you coming because they don't want a constant barrage of complaining. And if you're going through a tough time, you want friends who are supportive and not those who might say the wrong things at the wrong time like Job's friends or Job's wife in the Bible. You want friends who help you through the bad times and even process it and, and interpret it with you. And if the roles are reversed, you want to become a friend to those suffering and help them by not complaining, but by saying the right thing so they move towards God and wisdom and not away from Him. The story of Job in the Bible is a fascinating, inspiring story. For much of his story, Job suffers greatly. And due to marauding armies, he loses all of his oxen and sheep and camels and donkeys, and all of his field hands are killed. And a tornado then comes and kills all of his children. And in response, incredibly, he did not sin, nor did he blame God or complain. Then we come to today's readings, and things get even worse. Today's passage from the lectionary is from the book of Job, and I want to read from the message, which is a paraphrase of the biblical passage, for a more graphic understanding of this episode, but loses nothing in the translation. If you so desire, I invite you uh, to take again a worshipful posture, to please stand if you feel comfortable or remain seated as part of our worship of God, as I read from God's Word, from Job, chapter 1, and then uh, chapter 2. Job was a man who lived in Uz. He was honest inside and out, a man of his word who was totally devoted to God and hated evil with a passion. And one day when the angels came to report to God, Satan showed up. God singled out Satan saying, and what have you been up to? And Satan answered, God, um, oh, going here and there, just checking things out. Then God said to Satan, have you noticed my friend Job? There's no one quite like him, is there? Honest and true to his word, totally devoted to God and hating evil. He still has a firm grip on his integrity. You tried to trick me into destroying him, but it didn't work. And Satan answered, a human would do anything to save his life. But what do you think would happen if you reached down and took away his health? He'd curse you to your face. That's what. God said, all right, go ahead. You can do what you like with him, but mind you, don't kill him. Satan left God and struck Job with terrible sores. Job was ulcers and scabs from head to foot. They itched and oozed so badly that he took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself, then went and sat on a trash heap among the ashes. His wife said, 
Still holding on to your precious integrity, are you? Curse God and be done with it. And he told her, you're talking like an empty-headed fool. We take the good days from God. Why not also the bad days? Big verse. Not once through all this did Job sin. He said nothing against God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. His faith was sturdy. He was resilient. He was strong. But after his wife talks to him and three friends come to him, his faith doesn't get stronger but wobbles. But Job begins to doubt and get depressed. He then lets his bitterness fly and says, Obliterate the day I was born. Blank out the night I was conceived. Let it be a black hole in space. May God above forget it ever happened. Erase it from the books. May the day of my birth be buried in deep darkness, shrouded by the fog, swallowed by the night. And the night of my conception, the devil take it. Rip the date off the calendar. Delete it from the almanac. Okay, Job is feeling a little down here, right? Maybe depressed. He complains about life. He, he complains about his misfortune. He complains about a silent God. And I think we've all been there in some form, haven't we? It's okay to do that for a season. But then, finally, God answers Job and lays out the reality of who God is and says, Job, why do you confuse the issue? Why do you talk without knowing what you're talking about? Pull yourself together, Job. Up on your feet. Stand tall. I have some questions for you, and I want some straight answers. Where were you when I created the earth? Tell me, since you know so much. Who decided on its size? Certainly you'll know that. Who came up with the blueprints and measurements? Who, how was its foundation poured? And who set the cornerstone while the morning stars sang in chorus and all the angels shouted praise? And who took charge of the ocean when it gushed forth like a baby from the womb? That was me. I wrapped it in soft clouds and tucked it in safely at night. Okay, nothing like getting reprimanded by God. For 129 verses, God lets it rip and lays out the reality to Job about how God knows exactly what he's doing and that he, not Job, is all-powerful and omniscient, all-knowing. Then Job comes to his senses, nothing like being yelled at by God, and says, okay, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. And you said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Okay, my eyes have had heard of you, and now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Ashes is a big theme in this talk. What I like about the story of Job is that it's realistic. Job starts off as a strong man of faith, and in the end, he returns to his strong faith and even repents of doubting God's goodness. But in between, he had major doubts and depression, and he voices his heartaches. He started off strong, then kind of loses his faith footing, but then came back strong. And my prayer for us all, is that we will have a strong faith in the face of pain and suffering. But I would understand it if you go through a season of doubt or depression, complaining, and even anger. That's natural, but don't stay there. Don't live a life of complaining. Remember the famous Psalm 23 says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, don't stop in the valley. Keep walking through to get out of it. But Dan, you say, you don't know how hard my life has been. I know life can be very painful and difficult, but I also know that we can come back to faith 
in God in the end. And that is my hope and prayer for you all. How can we have courage and not complain all the time? So let me start off light and then get serious. Clearly, to be courageous, you'll need friends who are courageous, friends who give you wise advice, friends who know how to listen. Job's friends did best with Job when they just sat and listened to his woes. They didn't say anything. They didn't help as much later as they start giving advice, some good advice, but then they continued and gave not so good advice. And I think of the story of how people's interpretations of events may not be helpful. I remember the, the anecdote of a, of a woman who sat next to her husband lying in a hospital bed. And the man looked at her with thoughtful, teary eyes and said, honey, you know what? You've been with me through all the bad times. When I got fired, you were there to support me. When my business failed, you were there. When I got shot, you were by my side. When we lost the house, you stayed right there. When my health began to fail, you were still by my side. You know what, Martha? What, dear, she gently asked, smiling as her heart began to swell with warmth. He replied, I'm beginning to think you're bad luck. <laughs> um, that, my friends, is not the right interpretation of events. So we see that what we desperately need is a community of faith, like a church, like a small group, a life group, to keep us on course towards Jesus, to keep us um, posted to the North Star or the Star of Bethlehem. And if you're not in a small group, you need to seriously consider that. And you can get on the website or call the office. Pastor Steve kind of heads that all up of the small group. So life is really hard to go it alone. Now, let me read the entire, um, well, let me say this. Um, Job had a strong faith. So let's go a bit deeper. He, he would not doubt God in the beginning. And his theology was right on. As he said to his wife, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? That is very profound. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? And when there's tremendous pain in our lives, we can doubt that familiar um, verse in the Bible from the book of Romans where it says that all things work together for good. So let me read the entire verse from the Bible that says that in case you don't know it. It's Romans 8, 28, and it says this. We know that all things, not some things or a few things, we know that all things, all things, everybody say all things, all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purpose. And we can say, like, really? Like, all things? It's not that all things work together for good for anyone. The verse says, they work together for good for those who love God and who have obediently answered the call from God on their lives, and then they will understand his purpose. And man, I wish we could all believe this because we're really in, we're in hard times. You know, just before I went on vacation, um, I presided at three funerals for people in six weeks who attended our church. Um, there's a memorial service right after this service that I'll be leading. And you may not know this, but our church staff has been going through deep valleys of suffering. Um, four years ago, our chaplain, Mariana, uh, lost her husband, Rich. Uh, four, months, four months later, executive coordinator, Jenny, lost her husband, Carl. Uh, three years ago, our beloved organist, Bibi, passed away. Last year, our office manager, Linda, died 
of cancer. The same year, communications coordinator Roselia was diagnosed with cancer and had surgery. And Gary, who heads up our prayer team, um, years before that was diagnosed with cancer, but know that they're okay as they're undergoing treatment. In addition, last year on our staff, Patty, one of our administrative assistants, lost her husband. Two of our staff suffered concussions in the last two months. And yet our staff has faithfully, with courage, been supporting you all. One can say to God, okay, like enough already. So much pain for one staff. In addition, three in the circle of our church family have died due to COVID. In addition, many have lost jobs or their business or their health have suffered. I heard yesterday that members of our church, Mike and Jenny Wu, had moved to New Jersey years ago, finally bought a new condo in Hoboken, New Jersey, um, got the keys in February of this year, and moved in. Four days later, four days later, after moving in, a fire broke out in an adjacent apartment, and due to the fire, their condo was damaged, and all of their possessions were damaged, and they had to live in a hotel, one room, 300 square feet, for four months waiting for the repairs. And due to COVID, they were working out of their homes and had to work in this one hotel room with their newborn plus a dog. There is much pain in this world, and it seems to get worse. The Woos try to work things out with their insurance company. And on the day that the fire happened, Texas, where the headquarters is for the insurance company, gets hit with floods and a hurricane, and all of the computers go down for four days. This world is not our ultimate home. We live between the fullness of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this earth, not fully in the kingdom of God yet. And in this difficult time, we need to understand that, that part of life is that things are unexpected and things are incredibly hard. I think of a recent newsletter written by Logos Bookstore Manager Steve Prickett from Kentucky, and he begins writing very hopefully with Philippians 4, 6. He wrote, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all that He has, he has done. And then he writes... Marie and I have five grandchildren starting school this week. We've been praying for them and their parents and, and their parents as we've watched them prepare. Even in a normal year, there can be so much to be anxious about. What if they don't fit, fit in? What if the subjects are too difficult? How are we going to pay for all the extras? Will our kids make friends or be left out? And then we have the problems unique to this past couple of years. How is the COVID crisis going to play out as a new school year begins? Will our kids be learning remotely? or going part-time again. So much is unknown while so much is at stake. I genuinely empathize with all of you that have children beginning school. It can be a tough time with much uncertainty. And then he writes this from a very wise perspective. He writes this, there will always be unknowns. There will always be things outside my control. There will always be bumps in the road. Whatever comes with God's help, we can make it through. And that, my friends, I believe is the faith of Job. It's the realistic view that life is full of unknowns. There will be, not might be, but there will be bumps in the road. But all things will work together for good for those who love God and are called by Him. So today, right now, we may feel like Job, like where is God? I'm in so much pain. Do all things really work for good? Is that just a catchy phrase from the Bible or, or from the Netflix series Manifest? All I can say is that as you approach God and learn to love Him, 
then someday you might see the good in life. The good from a God who helps us in grief, in our suffering, and He really wants the best for us. He will stand with us. He will be with us always. And we can read this story of Job and think it's a fairy tale. This is really a Hallmark movie. No way could someone who has lost all of his possessions and his children can bounce back with a faith in God. No way. But what the Bible is saying and what I'm here to say today is yes, way. There is a way to live and love God and see how things can work together for good and not complain. Now, let me tell you a true story. Many years ago, I met a real hero of faith. I had the good fortune of spending an hour with her alone as she told her story that I was writing up for a little conference town newspaper in Montreat, North Carolina. Her name was Elizabeth Elliot. She was so inspiring to me. She passed away six years ago, but her proverbs have lived with me for many years. She would say things like, leave it all in the hands that were wounded for you. Whoa. She said, the will of God is never exactly what you expect it to be. It may seem to be much worse, but in the end, it's going to be a lot better and a lot bigger. Okay. Failure means nothing now, only that it taught me life. Wow. Today is mine. Tomorrow is none of my business. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. She said, to be a follower of the crucified means sooner or later a personal encounter with the cross. And the cross always entails loss. Wow. But what was the crucible that allowed her faith to be forged so strong and understand these lessons? Were these pithy sayings just fluff? Or did it come from her own life? How was her courage formed so she would not complain in life? In her book, These Strange ashes, again that word, she tells of her first years of Bible translating in South America. And she had a key translator on her team who she said was God's answer to prayer. She prayed and prayed and prayed for this person. This man was the key to the whole of the language work, the only man on earth who spoke Spanish as well as the language of the people they were translating. But then one day, he was shot and he died. It was a senseless shooting. And she wrote that her entire translation work now came to a sudden full stop. Such violence, such loss of life and work. How does one now say all things work together for good? Why not complain? Then the violence of nature hit. A huge flood descended upon her fiancé's mission work in a separate area, wiping out the entire compound all of the buildings, and that affected their, his work. Then a thief robbed Elizabeth's additional translation work, all of her files, all of her files, all of her year's work went down the drain. It's like the death of a dream, the ending of a vision which you felt called to do. This is not Job. This is Elizabeth Elliot of modern times. Later, Elizabeth married her fiancé, Jim Elliott, who as one of five um, young adult missionary men went to the Waodoni Waodoni people of uh, the Amazon rainforest in Ecuador, and they went to do good. They, They loved each other so much. They loved God. But then tragedy struck, and her husband and all four of his colleagues were speared to death by the people with whom they were trying to share the gospel. Elizabeth now became, after all the other sadness, now became a grief-stricken young widow who was left with a 10-month-old daughter. And if you can believe this, like Job's well-meaning friends, Elizabeth said Christians would tell Elizabeth 
that a loving God would never allow such events happen to a faithful believer. Ooh, that's got to hurt. Can she complain now? She would have a right to complain, right? In her classic book, Through Gates of Splendor, she wrote against that simplistic faith that there's a silver lining in everything that would reconcile all the pain. The pain will live on, she said, and she wrote this. God is God. I dethrone him in my heart if I demand that he act in ways that satisfy my idea of justice. It's the same spirit that taunted Jesus, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. There is unbelief, there is even rebellion in the attitude that says, God has no right to do this to five men who were killed and less. To be sure, life is incredibly painful. In addition to the pandemic, life is full of sorrow and hard turns and disappointments and betrayals. There's much tragedy in this world. You are not alone. As you all know, I've gone through a divorce in a, in a town where I didn't know many, was a seminary student with no job, wondered to a divorce lawyer, how do I get food stamps? I've had terrorists succeed in killing a distant cousin and nearly killing a first cousin at the 9-11 attack in New York 20 years ago. I've had loved ones, I've had loved ones take their own lives. Four, to be exact. Our businesses and ministries have suffered financially in the lockdown of COVID. And like many of you, I've lost my mom and dad. Tremendous sorrow, the full spectrum of pain. But how do we keep the faith? How do you and I not live a life of complaining and saying, why me? Why me, Lord? Why is the grass seemingly greener always on the other side? There needs to be made a decision in life, and you only need to decide once, and once you make that decision, cling to it and never let it go. And it revolves around this. Did a loving God come to earth in the form of Jesus? And if he did, will I dedicate my life to him and ask for his Holy Spirit to live in me? And if I make that decision and never doubt it, then only when I'm in the bosom of God will I be able to see that all things actually work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. His purpose, not mine, his purpose. Make that decision once and never turn back. It's like Sim Fulcher, the former associate pastor of this church who I talk story with like once or twice a month. He would go to the gym regularly because he said he made this decision only once that he would exercise. If you make the decision once, you never have to make it weekly or daily like, eh, should I exercise or not? Looks like it's raining, I feel a little tired. Nope, he made the decision. He made it once, meant it, and so he dutifully went, uh, uh, dutifully went off to the gym every week and lifted weights. He's in his 80s now. He was clearly the most buff guy in the whole staff. The decision was final. I always remembered that. You only make decisions once and then keep them. It's that, will I have daily devotionals? Make that decision once, not like every day I'm negotiating. Should I do it or not? Should I do it or not? Make the decision to trust God or not. You will then be in that secret place, as it says in Psalm 81. You know, and King David wrote a lot of these things. And he said, in distress, you called and I rescued you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. What does that mean? The secret place of thunder might refer to, to when God called Moses and his people and there was great thundering, but only Moses could hear God's voice in all of that loud rumbling. The secret place is a place of prayer. The secret place is a place of intimacy with God. It's a place of worship. It's a place of discernment. It's a place to live 
in the shadow of the Almighty, as Elizabeth Elliot's book title says, where the psalm says in Psalm 91, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And this I declare about the Lord, says the psalm, he alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him for he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Don't be afraid of the terrors of the night nor the arrows that fly in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Well, we're dreading a disease right now, aren't we? Whether it's a season of a pandemic disease or a tragic accident or an illness or loss of finances or a relationship, make the decision once and for all to, to, to not turn back but to live in the secret place close to God, in, this, in the safety under his wings, in the shadow of the Almighty, and you will find you will no longer complain. Your outlook in life will be changed. If you make the decision to believe and follow Christ, then make that decision once and keep it and hold on to it and cherish it and don't let go no matter what the circumstances. But grow in it and be discipled and read the Bible and pray. Why? Because you made that one decision. And then you will start thinking of others and their plight and not just yours. And there is a mission and there's a calling on your life now to help others, even though you're in pain right now. You will help to release the poor in Jesus' name. Why? Because you made that one decision to follow him, and that was part of the deal. And Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew in the 25th chapter, he said it's the same deal to help the widows and the incarcerated and to love the unlovable and forgive the unforgivable. And if you're a widow... Remember the words of Ruth, the Bible, who upon losing her husband thought not about herself, but rather about her defenseless, poverty-stricken mother-in-law, Naomi, and said to her, wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you live, I will live. And your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. And wherever you die, I will die. And there I'll be buried. Wow. Wow. Ruth had a mission to help another that transcended her own sadness and those of who have lost loved ones. So look for the mission that God will give you, for you still have much to do in this life. For once you make that decision, you who love God are called according to his purpose. You won't complain about your circumstances because you made that one decision that no matter how crappy life is, God is with you and all things will work for good if you love the Lord and follow him. In the end, you should know that Elizabeth continued the mission. Elizabeth Elliot went back to the same tribe that killed her husband and the other four men and eventually that Ecuadorian tribe converted to Christ. All things can work together for good, but far from how we would have imagined. And for Mike and Jenny Wu in Hoboken, New Jersey, who also suffered the ashes of their possessions, they said today they're grateful that they can live a minim minimalist life. Grateful that things are not important and grateful that due to COVID, they were home that day around two o'clock and not at an office where they could save their newborn child and their dog. The reason you make that one decision to follow Jesus is when you realize how much God loves you. That's why we sang over and over again, God is so good. God is so amazingly loving and is in love with you that he came to this earth in the form of Jesus and did so willingly, not because it was an obligation. 
and he was whipped for, uh, whipped for us, tortured for us, punched for us, stabbed for us, betrayed for us, and then died for us so that he would cover all of our sins, our wrongdoing, our lack of faith, not his, but that they might be erased so that we could always be in the presence, the holy presence in that secret place in the shadow of the Almighty. And that one decision of following Jesus has helped me through so much pain, the pain I had just described to you earlier, plus a lot more. You may not realize, but I preside at about 12 funerals a year, and then I attend more than that. And the reason they're painful is that they're all friends. Every church member who dies, I consider a friend who's, who supported and was part of this community. And as I said, there's another one right after this service. Then there are the loved ones of mine who died who are not part of this church. So in a sense, I always have this low degree of grieving or depression because I'm constantly saying goodbye. And some are tragic deaths that were really unnecessary. But I cling to the fact that God loves me and them. And I cling to the hope that God will always be with me. And I cling to the reality that God is so loving that he could sustain the faith and life of Christ followers like Elizabeth Elliot or a Johnny Erickson who became a quadriplegic after a diving accident, or a Corrie ten Boom who was put in a Nazi camp, concentration camp where her father and sister died for hiding Jews during World War II. And all three of those women, I've had the privilege of interviewing and spending significant time with them as they dedicated their lives to help others. My heroes are not pop singers or famous authors. It is women like these who, in tremendous pain and setbacks, who have courageously kept their faith to help and focus on others. But you too can be like them if you make the decision that Jesus is real and decide to follow him because he is your loving Lord. And I emphasize the word loving. He is your loving Lord who died on a cross for you, speared by nails to give you the gospel. I close in saying this. The last time I met Elizabeth Elliot was at the Urbana Missions Conference at the University of Illinois Champaign. And we rode together in the shuttle uh, to the big arena where she could speak. It just turned out we had the same motel. Um, and one night, I heard her say on stage these words that put all my suffering into perspective. She said, those hands that keep a million worlds from spinning into oblivion were nailed motionless to a cross for us. And she asked, can you trust him? And I say, yes. I say, yes. And what about you? Let's pray. Gracious God, forgive us when we forget how loving you are. Sometimes we think it's all about us. And often, we don't have the faith to believe you're always with us. Lord, there may be some people in this room or watching right now online who are at the point who are saying, okay, I want in. I want to follow this God who so much loves us. I want to follow this Jesus to bring me in that secret place in the shadow of the Almighty. And as I've said today, it all begins with just one decision, that I will commit my life to Christ, and I'll follow him no matter what. And so, Lord, there may be people in this room or watching online who want to just pray that prayer and make that decision right now and not turn away from this opportunity because you're speaking to them right now in their hearts. And there are people here who may have been on the fence for a long time. And maybe for some it's a rededication because to be honest, they've been plateauing for so long and 
And now they're feeling the spark of your spirit to say, come back to me and trust me and follow me. So Lord, people who are in that place, who want to go to the secret place, may they just say in the silence of their hearts this prayer that I'm going to lead them in. And they can say it with me now, which is basically just saying, sorry, thank you, please. That they might say with me in their hearts, Lord, sorry if I have been ignoring you for a while. Sorry that maybe I didn't really figure it out as clearly as today. Sorry for my unbelief and and my sins. But thank you that you're a God who forgives our sins. Thank you that you died for us. Thank you for coming to this earth and modeling love. So please, I ask, send your Holy Spirit into my soul, into my heart. For Lord, I want to commit my life to you. No turning back. I want to follow you and make that one decision that could transform my life. So if anyone made that decision, would you just raise your hand and I, as your friend and pastor, will confirm that before the Lord as you take this courageous stand like, okay, I'm in in a new way, in a fresh way, and I'm asking for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. You can raise your hand right now. Lord, thank you for all the people here in the room, those watching online. Bless them, Lord. Holy Spirit, fall upon them in a new and fresh way. And may they grow in their commitment and in their friendship with you because you are so good. God, you're so good. Pray that in our faith, we can always say no matter what the hardship is, it is well with our soul. In Christ's name, amen. As we move into communion, world communion, with all the believers all around the world, we're reminded that our Lord, on the night that he was betrayed, so what a connection, betrayed like some of us have been betrayed here on earth, he gathered his best friends in what we call the upper room. And during a Passover meal, he picked up a very simple piece of unleavened bread. And after blessing it, he then broke it. And said to his friends, every time you eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. It was one of the ways he was saying that his body would be broken for us, pierced, and he would suffer for our sake on a cross. And in the same manner, he then picked up a a cup and said, every time you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. And it was to remind us that the wine was like his blood that would be shed for our sake. And that this would be a new covenant. He's promising he will be with us no matter what. And so today, we do what he said, being obedient followers. And if you have this little cup that has, if you peel off the very top, there's a wafer on top. And that will be, in essence, our our bread and wine during this sacrament. So, Lord, we do this, um, and if you don't have it, just raise your hand, and, and here, it, right over here, an usher will come to you. Just raise your hand, and we'll give you this, this cup. Anybody else besides here? Oh, and over, and Anita behind you against the wall. Anybody else? Okay. And so together, with all of our brothers and sisters all around the world in different time zones, we say, Lord, we are following you. We are obedient to your your call and your command, and we take this cup and we take this bread in remembrance of what you've done for us. In Christ's name, amen. Please take it as you feel led.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, you are an amazing God. And in so many ways, you are so beautiful to us. Your presence, your name. And may we always have that relationship with you that you're this wonderful, beautiful God. Not only did you tell us to, to take communion regularly, but you taught us a prayer that we today call the Lord's Prayer. And you told us to say it often. And so now, Lord, we say it together, and maybe just like our brothers and sisters in other countries. And so we now say the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I just want to say that if any of you want some prayer right now, our prayer team is right in the prayer corner, just outside those glass doors in a very secluded, confidential place. They would love to pray with you of something maybe the Holy Spirit has brought up Why we've been here, whether it's physical, emotional, or um, um, spiritual. They would love to pray with you. And now um, I would like to offer this blessing to all of you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and its countenance be upon you. And may you know deep in your heart the wonderful love of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And may your faith be so strong that this will be a time where there is no complaining, but just the courage in Christ. In Christ's name, amen. Well, those of you online, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week. So a hui ho, I'll see you next week.